Greetings and welcome to History Fun Facts number two from Bygone Life. I am David G. and this is the series that focuses on interesting facts and tidbits from back in the day. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the origin of some of the appliances and gadgets found in every household today. But before we get started, I want to invite you all to visit our website at bygonelife.com. On this site, you can experience past events through the eyes and ears of those who were there, through original audio, video, photos, literature, and more. Also, you will find links to our Facebook and Twitter pages and our YouTube channel. Be sure to check it out and please consider subscribing to our channel. Let's start with the refrigerator in your kitchen. Nearly every household has one. Many modern day refrigerators not only keep food cool, but also make ice cubes and dispense cold water. So-called smart refrigerators keep track of how much of each item you have left and let you know when to buy more. We've definitely come a long way in this department. Back in the day, people kept their perishable food in ice boxes, such as this one. One drawback to these early day refrigerators was the fact that you had to have a huge block of ice delivered to your house every few days. Although large bulky refrigeration units were used in factories in the last half of the 19th century, it wasn't until the early 20th that practical electric refrigerators were available for home use. Who invented the first home refrigerator? Well, there seems to be some disagreement on that. Depending on who you ask or where you look, it was either Fred W. Wolfe in 1913 or Florence Parpart in 1914. I was puzzled by this discrepancy, so I did a little digging. From what I could find, it appears that Mr. Wolfe's invention was simply a unit designed to be bolted to the top of existing ice boxes, while Ms. Parpart created a whole new appliance. Of course, you had to have electricity to run one of these newfangled coolers, which many homes, especially those in rural areas, didn't have until several years later. And refrigerators were fairly expensive. Many households continued to use the old school ice boxes until well into the 1950s. By the way, before the electric version came along, ice boxes were called refrigerators. Did you know that the dishwasher was also invented by a woman? Yeah, Josephine Garris Cochran invented this rather bulky machine in 1886 and started her own company to sell it. She introduced her new invention at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. The original machine was not fully automatic, however. After hot soapy water was forced through jets at the bottom onto the dishes, the operator was required to pour boiling water over the dishes to rinse them. By 1909, her machine was beginning to look a little more practical. Take a look at this ad from 1950 for a portable model. Yeah, I'd hate to carry that around. Do you hate doing laundry? First, you have to haul the clothes down to the laundry room, load the washer, add detergent, then come back and load everything into the dryer. After all that comes the tedious folding and putting away. Imagine taking your laundry down to the creek and beating the clothes on a rock. In the 19th century, this method was replaced by a washboard and a big wooden tub. In the early 1850s, James King invented one of the first washing machines. It was little more than a hand-cranked metal drum. After 1865, a number of hand-powered machines were developed many with an attached wringer to remove the water from the clothes after washing. It was an improvement, but still not a lot of fun. In the early years of the 20th century, the electric machines appeared, such as this one from Thor. The machines didn't change much in the next decade. In 1915, Western Electric, a company most famous for making telephones for Bell, offered this model for sale. In the 20s, machines started to look a little less industrial and a little more like a home appliance. However, you still had to uh, fill the machine with a hose and wring out the water when it's finished. These early modern machines also didn't have a timer, so you had to start and stop it manually. The first automatic washing machine didn't come on the market until 1937, when Bendix declared 
their machine the successor to the washing machine. <laughs> what was that they had before? As you can see, there hasn't been much change since. It seems that most people these days listen to music on their phones, computers, smart speakers, or stream it through their home entertainment system. But before the internet took over the world, the central feature in most living rooms was a big stereo system with or without a turntable. Before that was the standalone phonograph or record player, as we call them. If we follow this chain of technological progress backward, we eventually arrive at the workshop of Thomas Edison, as you know, best known for his work on the incandescent light bulb. In 1877, Edison built a machine that pressed grooves in a tin foil wrapped cylinder. The first words recorded on his new machine were, Mary had a little lamb. Since vacuum tubes were still 25 years in the future, the sound was very weak. Later, a big metal horn was added to provide some amplification. The next year, Edison formed the Edison Speaking Phonograph Company to market his new invention and began making improvements to the device. The tin foil was replaced by wax cylinders, which lasted longer and could be shaved down to allow for new recordings. Edison soon had competition, however. In 1888, a guy named Emil Berliner created a machine that used a hard rubber disc instead of a cylinder, which he called a gramophone. This new system had some distinct, disadvantage, or some distinct advantages over the wax cylinders, however. The cylinders had to be recorded one at a time while many copies of the disc could be pressed from one master. Cylinders were limited to two-minute playback, while larger discs could hold much longer pieces. The competition went on for many years. And finally, Edison had to concede that the flat record was better, and in 1913 he, uh, he produced his Edison Diamond Disc. The battle was over, but Edison, uh, Edison's company continued to produce cylinder records until 1929. Soon, the rubber discs gave way to shellac and finally to vinyl. The metal horns were replaced by loudspeakers and sound quality continued to increase throughout the 20th century. In the late 1950s, two-channel stereo began to replace monaural sound and still later, four-channel quadraphonic recordings began to appear. Vinyl records continued to rule among home entertainment until the digital compact disc began to take hold in the 1990s. Although less popular today, there was a time not long ago that most people had several radios scattered around the house. We listened to AM for news, weather, and FM for music. In the late 19th century, many scientists and inventors experimented with electromagnetic or radio waves. In 1887, Heinrich Heinz, uh, I'm sorry, Heinrich Hertz, <laughs> Heinz, that's the ketchup guy, right? Proved the existence of these invisible waves with a simple spark gap transmitter, but it was an Italian named Guglielmo Marconi who proved that these waves could be used for long-distance communication. He also used a spark gap transmitter and devised an antenna system, and he succeeded in transmitting a Morse code signal across the Atlantic Ocean in 1901. In 1906, Lee DeForest invented the Audion, one of the first vacuum tubes, and it made it a lot easier to generate radio waves. The same year, Reginald Fessenden transmitted voice by radio for the first time, although he didn't use the forest's new tube, but instead employed a high-frequency alternator, like a, a generator, to generate the waves. Over the next decade, further progress was made in the radio art. Morse code transmitters were installed on ships to communicate with shore stations, and the military became very interested in the new technology. What we usually think of as radio got its start in the early 1920s as more people began to think in terms of one-way broadcasting rather than two-way communication when it came to radio. Soon, receivers appeared on the consumer market and the public was hooked on the new medium. 
The first commercial radio station, KDKA, in Pittsburgh went on the air in 1920. The first program that they broadcast were presidential election returns. Soon, radio was the most popular entertainment medium in America. The development of multi-station networks meant that listeners across the country could enjoy the same programs. Every night, millions of American families would gather around the big box in the living room to hear news, comedy, drama, and adventure programs. Radio actors and musicians became nationally known celebrities. During the early years of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt took to the air to reassure and inform the American public with his fireside chats. Radio continued to be popular until television started to encroach on its territory in the early 1950s. Comedy and drama shows were replaced by music as radio found a new niche in the entertainment world. And how about that big TV you have in your house? Chances are it has a screen of at least 40 inches across, an LCD or LED display, and lots of cables at the back to plug into various game machines and internet boxes. With all that technology, it's sometimes hard to believe that television didn't exist 100 years ago. The first television system, developed by Baird in 1926 in the UK, was actually more mechanical than electronic. It used a big metal disc perforated with holes spinning in front of a light-sensitive cell to scan an image and send the picture as a string of electrical impulses. At the receiving end, another spinning disc in front of a neon light produced a picture like this one. The system had a lot of drawbacks. The resolution was very low, and you had to make sure the receiving disc was spinning at exactly the same speed as the one at the transmitter. Still, it was a start. Over the next few years, all electronic television was developed, and many Americans got their first glimpse of the new entertainment marvel at the 1939 World's Fair. There was little progress during the Second World War, but the post-war economic and tech boom brought larger screens and more affordable prices. In the 1950s, television displaced radio as the entertainment medium of choice and also saw the debut of color TV, although high prices and few color programs meant that most households didn't replace their black and white sets for color until the late 1960s or into the early 70s. Still later, the big bulky picture tubes disappeared in, f in favor of the um, flat screen liquid crystal and light emitting diode, that's the LCD and LED displays, and internet connections meant we no longer had to wait for our fa favorite programs to be broadcast from a local channel, but we could view whatever we want on demand. I wonder what TV is going to look like in another hundred years. Well, that's about it for this episode of History Fun Facts. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I would like to invite you to join us for the next one. If you like this series, please subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Until next time, this is David G. And remember, we will never run out of history. <laughs> We're always making more of it.